Uh, parent systems can surely defend against hypersonic weapons. Russia and China have invested heavily in weapons that are only marginally more effective than existing ones, but they are extremely more expensive. How silly of them, that's not particularly brilliant, is it? Well, if this is the case, why the United States is investing heavily in hypersonic programs and it is on the verge of deploying one? The President's fiscal year's 2026 budget request includes 3.6 billion only for hypersonic weapons according to a Department of War briefing. Or why recent reports from Ukraine are telling us that the Patriot system has lost most of its effectiveness against maneuvering Iskanders and Kinjals. The usual charlatans on YouTube have explained how the hypersonic speed doesn't really do much to avoid interception, but this is quite far from the truth. Speaking of hypersonics, many invoke the plasma sheet or the difficulty of hitting a hypersonic missile with an explosion with an explosive warhead or the very short reaction time that is left to the defender to go through the interception process. All of these are fair considerations, but there is a flight mechanics issue at the core of the hypersonics effectiveness that I have never seen discussed outside university books or scientific papers. And it makes a huge difference. And in this video, we are going to see why. Hi, I'm Gas. Welcome to Millennium 7. So, hypersonic weapons pose an interception geometry issue to a degree that creates serious issues to current interceptors. If you consider, for example, the augmented proportional navigation equation... Sir, I have to remind you that not all of our viewers are nerds like you. Well, this is right, let's start from the beginning. So, hypersonic weapons are weapons that fly above Mach 5 for a substantial part of their flight path. Not that at Mach 5 something suddenly happens, it is a progressive transition from supersonic to hypersonic flight conditions. It is a conventional limit. But hypersonic flight conditions are indeed very different. For example, they are characterized by extreme thermal loads, uh, chemical instability and different fluid behavior. On the channel there is a series dedicated to hypersonic flight and its challenges. It is old, but the physics doesn't change, so you can have a look if you are interested. Here in this video we are more interested in understanding why they have been developed and why it is very difficult to defend against. And by the way, Almost every ballistic missile with ranges in the order of a few hundred kilometers is hypersonic in part of its trajectory. But that is not what we usually mean for hypersonic weapon. There are in fact two types of hypersonics, glide vehicles and cruise missiles. Glide vehicles fly unpowered after reaching hypersonic speed on top of a booster, Cruise missiles fly under their own propulsion. Both types can maneuver, that is, they do not fly a ballistic trajectory or the most direct line towards the target. In practice, the distinction is not so clean cut. Some gliders have trajectories more akin to a cruise missile than a ballistic one, while some cruise missiles are rocket powered, so the combustion is relatively short and fly unpowered for a large part of the flight. What they have in common though is that they are fast, very fast, and maneuverable. So how are they maneuverable? The change of direction happens because there is a lateral force with a component perpendicular to the flight path which will generate an acceleration perpendicular to the same flight path. The lateral force can be generated by aerodynamic means, that is moving the missile surfaces, or vectoring the thrust, if it is available, or even with small lateral thrusters, like it happens on the Patriot Pack 3. Please note that, because of the high speed, a hypersonic weapon doesn't change direction abruptly. Actually, any maneuvering flying object's turn radius does increase with speed. The force and the acceleration that can be generated is not infinite. 
but it is limited by structural and aerodynamic reasons. The higher the force, the higher the load factor, which is limited by the structural strength of the missile. Some modern missile can withstand up to 40 or 50 Gs without compromising the structural integrity, even though not all the missiles in service today are built to such a standard, or in practice, these levels cannot be reached. As it stands today, the only feasible way to defend from hypersonic weapons is to launch an interceptor missile to hit the incoming target while still in flight. The interceptor must maneuver as well, and it is subject to the same limitations as the attacker in terms of lateral acceleration. Ok, now we have launched our interceptor, and now the interceptor must be guided toward the target, and there are several ways of doing so. In this case, we are not talking about the sensors, which are important, don't get me wrong, but we are talking about the laws used to guide a weapon. That is, we are assuming that the sensors are working perfectly, which is not a given. The flight of an interceptor can be split in three phases, launch, mid-course and terminal, and they all require different laws. The launch phase goes from when the missile is given the final launch command to the end of the burn of the booster. The mid-course goes from the end of the boost to the beginning of the terminal, and it may or may not be a propulsion phase. The terminal phase starts when the interceptor can use its own seeker systems to guide itself to the target. If we assume an interceptor launched from the ground that is trying to hit a hypersonic weapon, it will use different guidance type and laws depending on the phase. The boost phase, it could even be unguided, being launched in the general direction of the target, and if it is guided, most likely the guidance will be a command guidance. That is, the guidance instructions are coming from an external source. These commands will direct the missile towards a calculated but approximate impact point. This simple law is called lead collision guidance. In the mid-course phase, the guidance will likely still be a command guidance, but the law may be different. For example, if the incoming weapon maneuvers, a lead collision point needs to be recalculated. If the maneuver is continuous, the impact point will need to be constantly updated, and the missile will fly in an unstable trajectory. This is a situation that those of you who play DCS know well, when an air-to-air -air missile is launched towards you, you try to notch the missile and invert the turn, dragging it in a zigzag trajectory that uses up the missile energy thereby. There are many different laws that apply to various missile types and targets. This is a very complex subject that would require a series of university lessons, and there is an abundant literature on, on the subject. In this case, there are lessons on YouTube about the navigation laws. I recommend Ben Dixon's lessons. They are very clear and very detailed. Here we just focus on the fundamentals. The most common and most used guidance law in mid-course and terminal is the proportional navigation. The proportional navigation is based on the consideration that two closing flying bodies will eventually collide if their line of sight remain constant. I know. I know, it doesn't make sense intuitively. In fact, this is one of the few situations in which the mathematics is clearer than the qualitative explanation. Sir, it is because you lost your touch since we moved, sir. Uh, Otis, you are supposed to help. Sir, you may not realize it, but I am helping. Ok, despite Otis' opinion, let's start from the basic equation for proportional navigation. There are several variants of this equation, but to drive home our point about the defense for hypersonic weapons, this basic equation is enough. Mind, the explanation I am going to give is extremely simplified. I hope that those in the know will forgive me. A with N is the interceptor's acceleration perpendicular to its trajectory. It is the output of the law, that is, the guidance system will issue commands to the aerodynamic surfaces, or to the engine gimbals, or any other mean, to obtain that specific lateral acceleration. Sometimes in literature it is called the latex. 
Dear viewers, please do not to Google it. This is my suggestion. Uh, yeah, don't Google it. Anyway, why do we want the lateral acceleration? Because to steer the interceptor, we need a lateral acceleration to curve the trajectory as we saw before. How is the lateral acceleration calculated then? In proportional navigation, it is the product of a navigation constant n times the closing velocity v with c and crucially the speed of variation of the line of sight angle or LOS rate denoted with d lambda over dt. I repeat, d lambda over dt represents how fast the line of sight angle is changing and it is measured by the missile seeker. In practice, the trajectory of an interceptor following a proportional navigation law is a sort of wide S. The navigation constant n is just a number that controls the shape of the trajectory, doesn't have any other mean, even though its role in the interception is important because choosing the right n then generates the correct trajectory. Modern guidance systems may vary the value of n during flight, making intelligent choices depending on the target behavior. V with C is the closure speed, that is the relative speed between the interceptor and the target, and normally in our case the two are closing the gap and moving roughly one towards the other. A situation in which the two are not closing is a situation where the interceptor failed the interception. Now, let's see what this equation is telling us. Well, the first point is obvious. The lateral acceleration is directly proportional to the closing speed. The faster the target, the higher the lateral acceleration required by the interceptor. As we saw before, there is an upper limit to the achievable lateral acceleration. If you try to generate a latex too high, the interceptor might break or become uncontrollable. So all else equal, which is not the case, but stay with me, a target flying at Mach 6 requires an interceptor with three times more lateral acceleration than one flying at Mach 2. But, you will say, the variation of the line of sight angle depends from the closing speed, so d lambda in dt may be smaller than 1, rebalancing the situation, and in fact it is lower than 1 if it is less than 1 radian per second, that is about 57 degrees per second. d lambda over dt is 0, which is the case where the target is pointing head-on to the interceptor, the lateral acceleration required is 0. This is the trivial case where the success of the interception does not depend anymore on kinematic considerations. Obviously, it never happens. It is never exactly zero. But we have seen something like this happening in real life in Ukraine in May 2023, when the Russians attacked for the first time Patriot battery with a Kinjal missile. The missile was pointing in the terminal phase straight at the battery and it was intercepted. Damage to the battery was caused by the falling debris. But the more the trajectories diverge or the higher is the closure speed, the higher the LOS change rate. The math is quite messy, the analytical solution is not really easy to understand, but the point is that a relatively small divergence of the trajectories is enough to cause a quick increase of the LOS rate when the two weapons get close and the hypersonic speed contributes to it, so the term becomes positive quite quickly, thereby contributing to increase the required latex. In fact, I don't know if it was clear, but the bottom line of all this is that a hypersonic weapon is easy to intercept when it is directed toward the interceptor, or it is far enough that its angular movement, the LOS rate, is slow. The closer it gets, the more the lateral acceleration required increases, and with the hypersonic weapons it increases terribly fast. Furthermore, since the hypersonic weapons we are discussing can change direction, this translates in a discontinuity in the change of LOS rate that might put the guidance system in prices. The LOS rate will change, it will increase, and it will require a higher acceleration that the interceptor could not be able to produce.
This situation is what makes hypersonic weapons so effective. Recent reports from Ukraine state that the Skander and the Kinjal missiles have been modified and they maneuver much more than before in a way designed to exceed the Patriot Pak-3 capability of intercepting them. What is the practical consequence of this kinematic situation? Well, we are used to draw the range of air defenses as circles. While it is technically correct, it is also misleading. The range is greatly reduced for a target that passes on the side of the launcher. There is no analytical formula to derive the shape of the area that can be covered by the interceptors, and it is actually a parametric area because it depends on the target flight parameters. You can only calculate this with simulations. However, in general, it is a sort of irregular egg-shaped area with the major axis oriented toward the direction of provenance of the weapon. The faster the target, the narrower the area a defensive system can cover. And the width is, as a very approximate rule of thumb, inversely proportional to the speed. A Mach 9 weapon will be intercepted in an area nine times narrower than a Mach 1 weapon. So you understand that against hypersonic weapons, area defense is almost impossible. To effectively protect every potential target, every potential target would require its own defense if the attacker is using hypersonics. For example, if a Patriot battery can cover an area about 100 kilometers wide against aircraft flying at around Mach 1, against a Mach 9 Circon missile, the width is reduced to 11 or 12 kilometers. And even this narrow strip could be radically reduced if the Circon missile maneuvers and follows a randomized trajectory. So an American carrier group with all the ships relatively close to each other is probably the best equipped unit to defend against hypersonics. But beyond that, it is very expensive and resource intensive to organize an effective coverage of the thousands and thousands and thousands of ground targets that are worth attacking in a land-based confrontation. You would have to put a Patriot or an S-400 launcher close to every target, and I don't think that I have to explain why this is not really viable. So, there you have it. Hypersonic weapons are difficult to intercept because they leave a very short reaction time to the defender. Moreover, being covered by a plasma sheet, they are difficult to pinpoint with the radar. Furthermore, their speed makes hitting them with an explosion very difficult. All valid reasons, but the key element that makes the defense from hypersonic weapons very, very difficult is the kinematic of the engagement itself that makes area defense almost impossible, thus requiring a proliferation of point defenses, which is, in practice, impossible. So thank you very much for getting this far into this video. This was sort of a gamble because I understand that that is not very glamorous, but I believe that my viewers are intelligent people and they will be interested into this kind of explanations. So this is it. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.